U.S. stocks are strong this morning on more signs of a soft landing. New Zealand business confidence surges as rates are cut, Australian capital investment plans remain strong, and India's GDP growth figures later today may seem to the Reserve Bank of India a dovish signal. That's coming up in our five things in five minutes. And then in our bonus deep dive interview, ANZ Chief Economist for Greater China, Raymond Yoon, unpacks how changing global supply chains are driving capital outflows from China's manufacturers. If these company encouraged by the National Development and Reform Commission to have a going out policy and to support the Belt and Road Initiative, then they would encourage them to invest more and increase the cross-border flow. So to some extent, this is either it is a mixture of uh, a market behavior and also the state mandate in managing the cross-border flow. But first, in 5 and 5 with ANZ, US stocks are up around 1% and US Treasury yields have nudged 2 to 3 basis points higher overnight, along with the US dollar index. That's after US GDP growth figures for the June quarter were revised up to an annual rate of 3% from 2.8%. That was stronger than market expectations and reinforced hopes the Fed is piloting the world's largest economy and reserve currency to a soft landing. Here's ANZ economist Bunsi Madhavani talking with me this morning from London. So far, it seems that this soft landing scenario that they tried to engineer is playing out. Um, They would like to maintain this balance going forward as well. So on that, we get the monthly PCE deflator data out today. And both headline and core PCE are expected to show 0.2% rise on a month-on-month basis. Now, that data would confirm actually that inflation progress did continue in July. And if the data are in line with these estimates, we think the Fed is geared up to begin cutting rates by 25 basis points in September. The US. US dollar index rose 0.3% by 4am Sydney Melbourne time, although the Aussie and the Kiwi dollars bucked that trend, rising in tune with a more positive risk-on sentiment. The Aussie is up 0.35% at 68.09 US cents, and the Kiwi is up 0.42% at 62.70 US cents. Number two, New Zealand business confidence about the wider economy surged in August by 23 points to its highest level in a decade. That's according to the ANZ Business Outlook Survey. ANZ New Zealand Chief Economist Sharon Zollner says falling interest rates were the key driver. When we see that firms are expecting better times ahead, we do have to bear in mind the starting point, and that is pretty grim. There was a one-point increase in experienced own activity, but at minus 21, it's still very weak. So I think it's clear that here and now firms are doing it uh, very tough indeed, but there does seem to be some light at the end of the tunnel. So the big question now is whether you know this is just a, a brief euphoria that will disappear in the wind or whether this is actually going to start affecting firms' decisions around things like employment and investment and whether this confidence sticks will actually really depend on whether firms actually see an improvement in the demand for what they're selling. Number three, Sharon says the business outlook contained both good and bad news for the Reserve Bank on inflation. The proportion of firms saying they expect to raise their own prices in the next three months actually lifted by three points to a net 41% of firms. And the amount by which they say they are going to raise them also ticked up from 1.4% to 1.6%. Both of those, that's the second consecutive month of increase. When in the big picture, when you look at a chart, they're very clearly trending down, but it would be it would be nice to see those still falling. Uh, but in some better news for the Reserve Bank, we did see inflation expectations one year ahead finally go under the 3% threshold for the first time since. Since July 2021. Number four, Australian retail sales figures for July later today will indicate how much of the stage three tax cuts are being spent. ANZ Research is picking a 0.3% monthly rise. That's within a market range of 0 to 0.8% growth. Meanwhile, capital expenditure fell 2.2% in the June quarter. But as ANZ economist Maddie Dunk says, there's positive signs about future plans for investment. What we saw was that investment expectations were up 10% between the second and third estimate. Now, the way that the CapEx expectations works is that the ABS asks people at different points throughout the year what they're expecting for the coming year. And we saw continued growth between the previous estimate and this estimate. And if I think about relative to what we were seeing this time last year, investment expectations are up about 8%. So there are some signs of some robustness there. Now, of course, this data is nominal, so some of it is going to be inflated away given that we are continuing to see very high construction costs, 
Number five, India reports GDP data for the June quarter later today. ANZ economist Duraj Nim is forecasting annual growth of 6.4%. That's down from 7.8% in the first quarter due to sluggish public spending during India's recent elections. He explains what that might mean for the Reserve Bank of India, which is forecasting GDP growth of 7.1%. Strong growth has given them luxury to go after inflation with full focus. Now, inflation is falling, we know that, but it is happening at a very gradual pace. But if growth falls much below the Reserve Bank of India's projections, that may call for a recalibration of their policy focus. And that would probably mean that the Reserve Bank of India relents and they probably soften their tone down in October and maybe start cutting in December, which is anyways our baseline forecast. Dear Ajnim there. Now, in part two of a bonus deep dive interview on capital outflows from China, ANZ Chief Economist for Greater China, Raymond Yung, explains why domestic Chinese investors, particularly manufacturers, are moving money offshore or just keeping it there after they've earned it. I think the reality in today's geopolitics is to still continue to emphasize more on, or increasingly on national security and economic expansion. So to some extent, even the Chinese direct investors or manufacturers, they need to move the money out to invest in other countries. Apparently that uh, there have been a lot of Chinese manufacturers increasing the investment in ASEAN country and Mexico to deal with the increasing trade protectionism stemming mainly from US and increasingly in Europe. So this type of uh, geographical diversification is happening and that would induce a lot of foreign investors from China and also other foreign investors that used to be having a strong establishment in China. For example, Taiwan manufacturers, contract manufacturers producing mobile phone for the US or even automakers from Europe used to be having a large establishment in China or Japanese as well. So they are diversifying and that would choose a lot of flow or we supply chain realignment away from China to other countries. So that is first first factor we need to look at. But at the same time, we also need to look at the interest rate scenario. That's a cyclical factor that would affect the management decision, the you chasing behavior of investors. So ultimately, that would be a mixed bag of factors affecting the cross-border flow. There's the one thing, of course, obviously, when you talk about China, it's a very special economy. It's because of this large public or state-owned establishments in China. So if they see that there's a strong capital outflow by the statement, they can order local or state-owned companies not to be too aggressive in investing offshore in order to stabilize exchange rate and their currency and avoid massive capital outflow or hurt behavior at the same time. And if these companies are encouraged by the policymaker, the NDRC, National Development and Reform Commission, to have a going out policy and to support the Belt and Road Initiative, then they would encourage them to invest more and increase the cross-border flow. So to some extent, this is either it is a mixture of market behavior and also the state mandate in managing the cross-border flow and FDI and also the ODI to some extent. Just finally, are there any signs that the authorities are concerned about the scale of the outflow or whether they want to try to reverse it or stop it? In the past few years, of course, that China's policymakers is very wary about the impact on the currency. Should China allow a free flow of capital across border? And so that they have been very cautious in managing the investment by local Chinese companies. They need to get a quota. They need to get apply for approval for specific projects and quota from SAFE as well. The state administration of foreign exchange provide a foreign currency quota. So these are the things that they have been trying to use this type of policy measures in order to manage the cross-border outflow. And going forward, of course, that the Jackson Hole Summit that happened last week offer an opportunity because if there is a turn of uh, U.S. monetary policy and the interest rate of or the EU investment yield of U.S. dollar start to come down and the interest rate gap between China and the U.S. start to narrow, that would provide some policy room for the policymaker so that they would not be that, I wouldn't say cautious, but I would say that they would see it as an opportunity for them to expand offshore again without worrying about herd behavior for yield chasing. So let's see if there's a momentum change in U.S. monetary policy that would also start to allow or facilitate more cross-border flow between onshore and offshore markets. I'm enjoying there. I'm Bernard Teki. That was 5 and 5 with ANZ for Friday, August the 30th. Catch you next week with what key U.S. PCE inflation data due tonight means for the U.S. Federal Reserve's rate cut cycle. This podcast contains general information only, not investment advice. You should obtain advice for your personal circumstances before making any investment decisions. Please view the podcast disclaimer available via your media player or email.